All right, so 5700 XT water block time. Uh, it's kind of funny that we got water blocks before we got custom cards. I mean, how could this take less time to fill up, figure out and machine when all that brands really have to do is just make the plate sort of match up with the new core and then however they want to handle VRM and all that, but whatever. That's besides the point. Today, we are checking out the special edition vector block from EK. One of the things that makes it different Ooh, ribbed for my pleasure. Today's video is sponsored by Drop and the Sennheiser PC37X professional grade gaming headset. Sennheiser is known for their legendary sound quality and gaming headsets are known for their legendary suck quality, but now you can have the best of both worlds without compromising mic quality, making it the perfect choice for gamers and professionals alike. The detachable 10 foot cable and 3.5 millimeter plugs ensure maximum compatibility while running your own amplifiers without taking up an additional USB slot. To learn more about the Sennheiser PC37X from Drop, click the link in the description below. So this is our reference 5700 XT. We do have an MSI model as well, which is just, again, a reference with a sticker on it. Um, but this is the one AMD sent. It's been running superposition now for about 30 minutes, maybe a little bit less uh, on loop. So we can get it nice and hot because what we want to check right now is what out of the box with the stock fan curve, edge temp and hotspot temp is, or T TJ Maxx or T junction, um, to see how much we're going to improve with the water block. Now we know already from previous testing with not just this card, but all the way to the Vega series, uh, heck, all the way back to Fury as well, that the better the temps are, the better um, you're gonna have with when it comes to the boot, self boosting and the boost clock and all that sort of stuff. No different with Nvidia. And one of the way the boost clocks work with GPUs, doesn't matter if it's Nvidia or AMD, is if you have power limit overhead and you have temperature overhead, then the clocks will go higher and sustain themselves. Now, yes, we can go into Wattman, uh, Global Wattman and we can lock those settings and all that, and we can trick it. We can play the fan curve and all that sort of stuff. But the point of today's video is I wanna see by just taking out of the box settings, touching nothing, which is believe it or not, the way most people operate their graphics cards. They take them out of the box, they stick them in and off they go. They might play with a slider a little bit. Um, but I wanna see what will happen when we just take a water block and put it on. So we're gonna compare things like edge temp, uh, TJ Maxx. We're gonna also, uh, or they call it T-junction. <clears throat> we wanna see, we're, we'll probably do a 3D Mark Time Spy Extreme, cause that's a huge load on the GPU, just to see what happens to our graphics score. Cause we already know that if we can keep the temps down, we keep the clocks up and it keeps the power draw down as well. The cooler it is, the less power it actually draws. So that's why you also have a different conversation between TDP and max thermals and all that sort of stuff. They're not the same, like, TDP is not necessarily power draw and it's not necessarily temperature. It's, it, there's a weird correlation between a few different things that are happening there. So what we're gonna compare here today, like I said, what our time spy extreme score is and what our max temperatures are. Now in terms of getting max temperature, we've been running um, superposition here for approximately 30 minutes now, just looping, looping, looping. I don't have my thermal camera on, but I dared uh, Phil to touch the back of the core, because I don't know if you guys know, on the back of this card, the core is exposed. You can actually see all the SMT, uh, SMDs and stuff. He touched it and nearly burned himself. It's hot, the back plate's hot, the cooler shroud is hot, everything about this card is hot. The factory fan curve is extremely conservative, where it's favoring high temp over acoustic, which is making everything heat soak really, really badly. So this would be even hotter if it were in a chassis and it wasn't uh, exhausting very well. So let's go ahead and hop in here to, um, Global Watt Man, Global Watt Man, and let's see what our temperatures were. So our GPU uh, max was uh, 1932, and our temperature was 84C. And if we come down here to T Junction, you can see they're currently the same right now, but it's not showing us. Oh, Junction Temp, 98C. Now these these seem extremely out of control, but they're not. And we covered that with the Radeon 7. In fact, Nvidia cards do the very same thing, but just like uh, CPUs and stuff, they tend to favor either an average or like an edge temp to make the temps look better than they really are. Every die has a hot spot and an edge temp. So AMD is just being forthcoming with at least showing you those temperatures now. I wish Nvidia would do the same thing. So now that we've got those numbers recorded, my super scientific way of recording it right here. <clears throat> and then we wanna see our averages here. Our average was 79 and 92. So what we wanna see is if there's gonna be any sort of improvement there. Now what I'm doing right now is I'm gonna go ahead and just let the card cool down. Cause even right now it's still sitting in the 60s. That fan curve is extremely, extremely conservative. So what I wanna do right now is I just wanna go ahead and max out our fan to cool it off in between tests right now. 
So that's what the card sounds like at 100%. Pretty typical blower cooler, but they, because we couldn't hear it at all, even though we have the AC on right now and it is 100 degrees outside today, so we want to control the environment without introducing too much ambient temp. Uh, it's amazing how much they really favor noise over performance, but that's the thing. You don't need a water block. You can go into the settings and you can play with that fan curve. And if it were inside a case, it would be muffled even more. Um, but looks like we're cooling off. Our shroud is still kind of warm here though. We want this to be nice and cool. Looks like we're at 34 and 34, 33. So I'll probably wait for it to hit about 30, 31. And then what we'll do is we'll just do the time spy run, like I said, and we're only gonna be looking at graphic score. That's all that matters in this test. So while the system's rebooting here, I decided to go ahead and plug in the uh, digital RGB header to our ASUS board. And you can see right there, the Radeon, it's got a nice gradient to it. The only thing that kind of sucks is if you're not vertical mounting this in a case, you see no lighting from the direction that you actually, you know, I guess wherever this goes in, we're at the vertical mounted, aren't we, Phil? All right, so our graphic score was a 3945. Our original score when we first tested with the press drivers was a 3927, I think it was. Um, so yeah, we are definitely right in line with where we we're supposed to be. We're not seeing any craziness. Uh, so yeah, we saw the temps, we saw our score now. So now we've got to go ahead and, is it hot? Yeah, we got to cool it off. And then we're going to install the block. <laughs> All right, so here it is featuring the special edition block, which as you can see, they, they made the milling kind of match the factory card. They put the dent in there too, although it's not a real dent. That's just the way it's, it's milled. I kind of wish they'd put it in the same spot and made it kind of carry over into the chrome so it's not in a different spot, but whatever. Um, I also chose not to use the backplate they provided. I'm using the factory backplate because I feel that this looks better. I don't like nickel backplates with acetal blocks. If I have a nickel block, not to be confused with nickel back, uh, if I have a nickel block, I then go with nickel back plates. So I don't like it mixed and matched like they sent it to me. I just like the way the factory back plate looks, plus it still says Radeon. I've tested this in the past where once you water cool the front of the graphics card, there's not nearly as much heat soaking through to the back. If you're using an air cooler, or at least in this case, the factory blower cooler right here, because they're using these thermal graphite pads, which I don't think are nearly as good at transferring heat, I feel they've got an abundance of this left over because they discontinued the Radeon 7, which is why we're seeing it here. I believe Gamers Nexus did a video where he used thermal paste instead of the this, the, the graphite pad where the temps came down. Don't quote me on that, I, I didn't see that video. I believe we talked about it though in person briefly. So whatever. Let's go ahead and hook this up. Let's get a 240 mil rad on here because I believe that's gonna be plenty. And of course, we've got to hook up our digital RGB because we want to see all the, the Radeon letters glow again. Okay, so we're up and running here. Same pump and reservoir that we actually use when we do our ice bucket stuff with the, the Gamers Nexus challenges that we do. Um, Alpha Cool radiator, we got our Metallic Gear fans, and then of course our um, Alpha Cool fittings, tubing, and then our EK water block. I forgot to mention this though, and I, and I do this every time, and I forget to put the link down below, and I apologize if I did that again this time, but please check down below. I'll put a link to these iFixit kits I know they sponsor a bunch of tech YouTubers. I'm not one of them. My wife bought me this for Father's Day uh, like two years ago. And it's got all the fittings and stuff that you would need to work on your own computer. So every time I show these kits, people gasp me a million times like, where'd you get it? What kit is that? So it comes with all the stuff you would need, like the spudgers. And this is actually a kit that you'd use for fixing like a phone, but obviously you can use it for a computer, anti-static um, strap and all that sort of stuff. So anyway, they're not that expensive and they've got every fitting bit you would possibly need to work on electronics. So like I said, not a sponsor, but if you guys wanna help out the channel, there's a link to the description in the description below to where you can buy that on Amazon. All right, so we're up and running. First things first. All right, so our idle temps are at 31 on edge temp, 32 on junction temp. That's pretty much the same as what the air cooler is doing with its factory curve. And the reason for that is this GPU Navi, when it goes idle, pulls back the clock as far back as six megahertz. At least that's what's reported. I don't know what the true 
megahertz are, but every monitor we've looked at has said six. We're currently running 61 megahertz because we have the Time Spy screen open. So that's why we're not really seeing an improvement to temperatures at idle because the power draw has got to be stupid low at this particular um, frequency. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to go ahead and leave Global Wattman open. All settings are factory. Um, hitting reset just to be sure. Okay, there we are, factory. And we're going to run Time Spy Extreme now. We're only looking at the, the graphic score because we can compare that to our first run and we will see how much the score increases. Now, I believe 3929 was our official benchmark run when we did the review and it was slightly higher than that by like a couple of points when we did our test prior to this. We want to see if the water block is improving any of the boost algorithm or how far it can go uh, by just keeping it as cool as possible. So original score at launch was a 3929. Our score at the start of this video with the non-press drivers, with the reviewed or released drivers were 3945, and now we're at 3994. So we've gained uh, almost 70 points in Time Spy Extreme, which is actually a lot. Time Spy Extreme is extremely difficult to run. We gained a full FPS, but the reason for that is if you look up here, this temperature drop, our junction temp down to 41C, uh, or excuse me, our junction temp down to 62C, our edge temp down to 41, brought up our GPU frequency to 2007. Remember, we were at 1935, I believe it was. Phil can annotate if I'm wrong. So we gained additional P-state or turbo clock because of the thermal headroom. It's no surprise though that Navi and Ryzen and Pascal and Turing and all that scale with temperature. The lower the temps, the longer you maintain the boost clocks and the higher the boost clocks can go. So if you look at the frequency curve though, that orange line right there, it's 1798, 1869, 1817, 1931, peaks up to 2007 right there. But our power draw is also slightly higher. Our max power draw was 193 watts versus our previous run, which is actually 166 watts. But that's because we went with a higher target or a higher clock frequency for a longer period of time, it pulled a little bit more power, but that's fine though. I mean, we're, we this card is running so much cooler, uh, we could actually touch the back of the GPU core with all the SMDs without burning yourself. I would highly recommend not doing that if you're running a factory card, but if you want to test it yourself and you're running one of these 5700 XTs with the blower cooler, I dare you to touch the back of it, but any injury you sustain is totally on you, not me. So what do we do next, Phil? You think we should overclock this real quick or just let that be that? 4164 and all we did was click a single button, but it maxed out at 2086. Our temperature, 44 and 72. So we're doing a stupid, dirty overclock, apparently doing it wrong. We just maxed the power, power limit and then we locked the minimum frequency at 2050 and the max is 2150. So we're given 100 megahertz to play around with there. We're trying to keep the, the low from going down. And then we allowed it the maximum amount of voltage it wants. So this is kind of like the way he would almost overclock like an like a Kepler base card, because you don't have voltage control anymore on, on Pascal or Turing. Let's just see if it gets through here and doesn't crash. We know we have the temperature headroom. If it doesn't crash immediately, that's probably a good sign. So we played around with a couple of different things. The manual overclock, we got up to over, it was like 4239, and then auto undervolt actually brought us up to 4042 without touching anything. So just auto undervolting gave us enough additional power limit and temperature limit to where the card uh, automatically boosted itself to what, 2038 megahertz and 42C on the edge temp, 65C on the junction temp. But this brings up a really interesting conversation that um, we have to talk about. So we just got our highest score yet, 4,251. But if you look at, we did it on a stock card with a stock cooler. Why is that? Well, that's because silicon lottery. It got to the point to where no matter how cool you keep the card, you're only gonna get so far with it. So it brings up the next discussion, is water cooling the 5700 XT worth it? Well, only you can answer that. See, here's the, here's the logic I always employ when it comes to, is it worth water cooling? I'm a water cooling enthusiast. It's, it's a fun mod I like to do. I enjoy it. I enjoy the problems that come with it half the time. The other half of the time, I don't enjoy it. That's kind of how that works. But usually the logic I will always preach to people and I try so hard to instill is, if you have to sacrifice buying a more expensive graphics card to afford the water block, that makes no sense because you're not gonna make up the performance difference by water cooling and overclocking a lower end card than just buying the faster card with an air cooler. In this case, there's nothing higher than the 5700 XT. Asterix, Radeon 7, which this score nearly beat. But there's nothing higher than the 5700 XT if you're only willing to buy AMD. 
because you take the price of this particular block, north of $120 for an EK water block, and add it to the $400 price point of the 5700 XT, puts you smack dab in the middle of the starting pricing for 2070 Supers from NVIDIA. Now, if you're the kind of person that's like, I don't care what brand the card is, I just want the best performance I can get for the money I have to spend, then putting a water block on a 5700 XT doesn't make FPS sense or financial sense. Because although these scores are doing very, very well, if you look at synthetics and some gaming benchmarks, it approaches 2070 super territory. It approaches like 2070 non-super territory for sure. But the 2070 is gone. And the 2070 super now would make more sense in terms of getting FPS per dollar. But there are plenty of people that are out there that are like, hell no, I'm never buying an NVIDIA graphics card, in which case this still may or may not make sense to you because we just showed that by sticking with air and just putting a stupid fan curve on there with the same settings, we got the same scores. And so that means when the AIB cards come out with their aftermarket air coolers, you're gonna get these level of scores without the hair dryer sound effect that comes along with a blower style card. If you've already got a blower style card and you were just waiting for water blocks, then this whole video made no sense to you anyway because you were already planning on doing it. So our recommendation would be, if you're a water cooling enthusiast and you like to water cool, then who cares what we have to say or anyone else? Do what you wanna do and what you like. But if you wanna maximize your money, it might make more sense to spend the 50-ish, maybe $75 premium that you might find on the overclocked custom PCB air-cooled cards that are coming in the future over going to the water block. And that's always been our recommendation. It's never changed. And no matter how many times I preach it, people still challenge, why is water cooling it's stupid? Well, some people it is stupid, but not to people like us. And I happen to think that we people are the ones that matter. No, I'm just, we people. All of my personalities would agree that water cooling is fun. But I still, like I said, would not recommend buying a lower end card to water cool. All right guys, thanks for watching. Hopefully you learned something today. Um, I sort of validated and invalidated water cooling all in one breath. But that's how we like to do things around here. Controversial.